And good evening or good morning, everyone, and welcome to the other side of midnight. That magical time when, you know, it, this used to be a special time. And now, if you're looking at the news, it's madcap, strange, bizarre, weird, uh, other side of midnight stuff 24 7. And tomorrow night, we're going to really get into the thick of it because we're going to be talking with uh, uh, Steve Bassett for the first hour. He's got some very interesting ET UFO updates, and of course, he's in the center of the storm. You know how they always say that hurricanes are very calm in the middle of the eye? Well, I've actually lived through a few hurricanes and had the eye go across, and that's true. But if you're in the eye wall, which Washington, D.C. right now appears to be, it's anything but calm. And, uh, you know, Steve, as you know, Stephen has a... uh, Opinions on almost everything, and he has some very intriguing opinions about uh, uh, the president and disclosure and what's going on on the Hill. There are things going on. Remember, our prediction is that disclosure in some form or another, where people who haven't been following, you know, the increasing openness of agencies and researchers and NASA, you know, saying – we're going to announce life on Mars in two years. If, if, if people aren't noticing all that stuff, they should be noticing that um, we are moving closer to something. Um, who was that guy at MIT uh, who talked about a singularity? Anyway, um, we may get into that tonight because tonight's going to be a very interesting show. You know the old joke, uh, two guys walk into a bar. Anyway, tonight we're, we're in 10 forward which is the uh, lounge of the USS Enterprise. And we have as our guest Ron Gerbron, who has a remarkably intriguing and broadly diversified background. If you go to the other side of midnight.com, that's our homepage. Click on tonight's banner, which is a two journalists walk into 10 forward for October 26, 2019. Click on that. Let me give you a background, a thumbnail sketch on uh, who we have on tonight. Ron Gerbron, of course, among other things, is a member of the Enterprise Mission Imaging Team. He has been writing remarkable information to be included in our Perspective Mars book. And yes, we're still working on the Mars book. I don't want people to get discouraged. You know, I'm I'm a great fan, as you know, the old Gallo wine commercial, Make No Wine Before It's Time. And we're we're waiting on a few more items, but I guarantee you that when we bring the book out, um, it's going to be well worth the wait because, well, some of the things that are going to be in the book we're going to talk about on, uh, tangentially tonight, some of the implications and the data, of course, will uh, be in the book. So you're going to want to obviously get a copy as soon as uh, we have it available. It is on – on it, it, it's coming. Let me just say that. It is coming. Ron is a proudly uncredentialed polymath. Uh, he wrote that. With a proudly uncredentialed and deeply interested uh, background in archaeology, he was raised on a farm in Pennsylvania, and he collected arrowheads as a child. I, I never got around to doing that. I was more into wildlife, you know, keeping snakes in the kitchen and insects and rescuing lots of birds, including, uh, including robins. Anyway, he found the programmatic aspects of education about Uh, everything back then a bit limiting after attending a very famous Quaker school in Pennsylvania and ahead of his studies and his time he attempted to contort himself into attending college for a while before giving up on academia and moving overseas where of course he got an extraordinary education as we're going to talk about in all that time Ron has focused his core attention on the metrology of our paleo history particularly on other planets, especially the planet Mars. So without further ado, Ron Gerbron, welcome to The Other Side of Midnight. Well, hello, Richard. Hi, everybody else. Hi, what Dr. a wonderful bio. Hi. What a wonderful intro. It was, <laughs> Thank you. Thank most you. Most of it was even – yeah, most of it was even true. Uh, what was this famous Quaker school in Pennsylvania? I've always been intrigued with the called- Quakers. Oh yes, it's well. The the interesting thing about them is that you learn about everyone's religions. I mean, they're not they're really closer to theosophy, although they hate it when people say that. 
as a, you know, if you want to know a kindred uh, spiritual movement, they more grew out of that. That's why it's called the officially the Society of Friends. Uh, Quaker was something that people should pay attention to in these um, excessively woke times because that was an insult word that was coined by one of uh, one of opponents. He was, yeah, we we, we kind of lost uh, you was, for a moment there. Oh, yeah, one of they, they were. Uh, oh, anybody that anybody that rocked the boat was a problem, and it was basically a youth movement when it started. Believe it or not, uh, the uh, young people running around. Um, a very famous girl named Hannah became the uh, first martyr. Not that they have a lot. I mean, they're all about pacifism uh, because she ran through a town to advertise their presence, but she was naked at the time. And in the 17th century, that was, uh, well, let's just say that bad things happened to her. And, hmm. uh, well, here's a question yeah. I've always wanted to ask, and I never knew who to ask, so I'm going to ask you. If the official name of the church is the Society of Friends, is that correct? Yes. Where did the term Quakers come from? That's what I'm coming coming to. The uh, uh, John Fox, founder fellow, uh, was writing about the um, ecstasy of uh, it's, it looks like something out of Eckenkar or something. You know, writing about the ecstatic experience of uh, appreciating, approaching, merging with God, this kind of thing. And he said he was quaking with the glory of the Lord. And so this mocking editorial was written about what he said, and the uh, the guy made a big deal out of the fact that he had uh, said something as preposterous as quaking in the presence of the Lord, and so he uh, he he dubbed the whole movement Quakers. And wow. um, I I wasn't there at the time, but you know <laughs> people thought about it. Uh, not quite uh, a couple weeks later, uh, the um, yeah the people talked about it and uh, said. Well, okay, we'll call ourselves Quakers. You know, they embraced uh, – it's a pacifism thing, I guess. They embraced the insult instead of getting all offended. And um, like I said, the people might take that to heart, but that's where that came from. Hmm. You know, it's like the Mormons are technically – what is it? Uh, Church of Latter-day Saints right, right. of Jesus Christ or something. And, uh the um, yeah, Mormon isn't a proper term either. They don't they don't like it much, but they're they're a little crankier. Uh, <laughs> well, as long as you're on Quakers a roll, are. what wh where did Mormon come from, and what what uh, what in insult was that supposed to mean? Ooh, you got. I believe that that was a name, but I you got me there. I am not an authority on the uh, uh, what led up to that uh, glorious uh, tabernacle they have down in La Jolla. Well, at least, at least I have, go ahead. Yeah, they have lots of money, and they do very good archaeology because they're intent upon building their case for um, the uh, New World era civilizations that predated anything else. And if if you've ever read through the Book of Book of Mormon, you know that's what they're talking about uh, the, the a past civilization here. Uh, it's not as doesn't strike me. Well, I don't want to say anything bad about them, but let's just let's just say it's it's kind of a, a less uh, rich and and um, metaphorical read than like the King James Bible. But you know, it's a nice story. You know, but they say stuff like the uh, and then great battles ensued, which which take up too much space to mention here, and then just move <laughs> on to something else. Uh, <laughs> Honest to God, that, that's a, that's that's not even a, much of a paraphrase of something that caught my eye in there. Was, but it, no, it's a good read. People should read these things. Uh, but yeah, I don't know much about them. And strangely enough, they're a group that the Quakers don't get along with much. So uh, well, that's interesting. You know, normally, you think they get along with everybody. Yeah. And um, I uh, and uh, they're of course they're quite a bit more um, left leaning politically in current days than. I ever was, but I think a lot of the membership is like that too. You know, it's like I don't know. Never, I needn't talk about them. The school's name, however, is West Town. Okay. Let me skip forward. Long time. Um, you know, yeah. as part of your bio, you basically gave up on academia, which of course is uh, 
not a bad thing. But then it says you I moved, did. I took a it says you moved overseas. I mean if, if you're a kid, you know, jumping on a tramp steamer and going to Hong Kong, where did you go overseas and what was that like? Okay. No no no. That all started with the first time I left the country was um in uh, college and it was a uh college trip but you know not just a uh not just a hapless week long trip to venice like spider-man just had or something uh it was uh something that's it's still around but they changed the name i think they call it semester at sea now mm. uh it was once called um uh world campus afloat and I think it even had another name for a year or two before that started. But um, it was a um, yeah, 506 foot ship that had been built back at the end of World War II as a troop carrier, but that it turned out they didn't need it, so they re- they refitted it into a you know a, a passenger liner. And um, oh, I love old ships like that. Was this yeah, one of those you know. famous Liberty ships? Yes. Yes, it would be one of those, and that was uh, it's called the Rhine Dam, and mm. they reused that name one time since then. It's not the same one that you, is floating around now, taking people up to see icebergs, but it's um, uh, yeah, Holland America Line, and I have nothing but good things to say about them and their ships and and the whole thing. And I like the older ships better than the new ones. I've been on not for a cruise, but I've been on like one of those new Carnival liners. Mm. I wouldn't even. Ad- I wouldn't even enjoy that. It's like a casino. For, it's just it's it's too posh. You know, same reason that driving, I would usually not even turn the radio on unless it was somebody else in the car or I was listening to a news story. You know, you just kind of listen to your environment. So you're in college, yeah. and part of the uh, curriculum involves getting on this ship and going somewhere. Where and for yeah, how we were long? taking classes. Uh, well, all around the world. And oh I, my God! Uh, but what an adventure! I know, and it was better back then than now, only because of the volatility of so many environments. But the, yeah, that got me started, and I realized that I really liked that. So uh, there were, uh, I was. Let's see, I did that four times, which is more than most people. They, it gets very, very cheap if they like having you around and you're good with shepherding the cats and so they uh, <laughs> uh said no this is somebody we want in the mix here uh, and um, okay. that that was fine but that was about all they had for that and then i um went on to other things so and where I did was, you go i mean you know you were you were what you were early uh, late teens early well, 20s let's see. Yeah. yeah no i was uh 18 19 at the time and the, well, let's see. Uh, West Africa, uh, Senegal, Sierra Leone, Morocco, South Africa, uh, over around the other side to Kenya and uh, down into Tanzania, and um, never been to Egypt. Uh, oh my you know, God! So it wasn't like a Mediterranean cruise. Portugal, Portugal's cool. People should more people should go to Portugal. The Portuguese are really, really interesting, and um, they um, Spain, of course, because it's like right next to it. Um, and went up to Andorra, and uh, that wasn't part of the, anything official, but that's the only place you can see Paleolithic plants and animals. Not so many critters, but I mean the uh, the trees and everything. See, they never suffered any ice age. They were shielded there in the Pyrenees, right? And so that's what the that's what the flora and fauna looked like uh, twelve thousand years ago in the rest of Europe, which is kind of interesting. And England and Ireland, uh, no place in the world is greener than Ireland. Um, <laughs> that's just, true. Despite, I don't know why. Despite, I, despite Winston Churchill calling England this Emerald Isle. Yeah. He called England the Emerald Isle? Mm-hmm. Hmm. Oh, well, okay. Yeah, I mean, they can be a bit cranky sometimes. And frankly, I've had much less trouble with completely foreign languages than I did when I first heard a uh, heavily Irish accented uh, English. It takes you a couple of days to kind of get accustomed to it. Mm-hmm. Other than uh, up until up until then, it just sounds like gibberish. It's the uh, the cadence and everything else is completely different. But so was, that, so, was, so was so was so was Japan. 
so every was, place but China. Go ahead. So was the college uh, on land and they chartered this ship, or was it on the ship and they just kept sailing? Oh, no. Oh, on the ship. Yeah, it wasn't a sailing ship. Yeah, it was, um, but uh, those are cool too, but that's not what it was. Uh, but we were not usually traveling the normal shipping or uh, routes because – the back in those days when the academic part of it actually mattered, it doesn't look like I, I still get alumni stuff. It doesn't look like they that's an important consideration now. They're talking about the Wi Fi and the cabins and stuff like that. Mm. Uh and legacy cruises, you know, this was no, this was just us and um get some malcontents out of the country for a couple months at a time. That's an but, extraordinary um, yeah. educational experience. My God, you know. The, you know, Horace Greeley, go west, young man. You went west and kept going and found that the earth was round. I mean, tell us some of the stuff that happened. You know, you must have met all kinds of intriguing people <laughs> and had adventures. And I mean, at 18, 19, the best time of your life oh, yeah. to be traveling and to have adventures. And I mean, you forgot strapping the handsome, yes. <laughs> uh, yeah. Uh, well, let's see. Um, England is terrific. See, a lot of this stuff has changed. Remember, this was 50 years ago. So things are a little different in a lot of places. Like I said, I wouldn't want to do the same thing now unless it was my unless it was my ship and I could just choose whether I wanted to port there or not, you know. Mm. But um I remember a big argument we had on board the ship because we couldn't go into one of the South American ports because they were having an outbreak of something or other and um the um the ships have to dump their uh, uh, dump off their bilges and get fresh water and stuff like that, and then they won't, can't go to the next place if the last place uh, had cholera or something like that. So that's still the case. So they were all worried about it. They couldn't go there, and said, "Well, let's go to Easter Island." And um, huh. they, uh, yeah, <laughs> but they, uh, well, it was, you know, detour is a detour. Uh, I mean, this is like having your own starship. You can visit any planet you want. Oh my God, what? Ron was yeah. an incredibly well, we lucky adventure, and and what were you? Oh, I know. Were, were, did you go places as part of a curriculum, or did they just have like an itinerary, and you had classes that were separated from where you were going to wind up? Oh no, they it was yeah, there was an itinerary. I mean, you know, you could you could not show up for stuff. What are they going to do? But uh, the, <laughs> well, unless um, you get off the ship, and yeah, and it's, and in terms of in terms of superficial. Um, research uh someplace like greece you know yeah. a couple of days and you're done i mean if you want to spend more time there great but it's not uh uh you know all the uh all the stuff that anybody's ever heard of are all in one place and uh, so forth so it's uh, you know you take the day do athens it's not like going takes less time than like exploring the louvre or something um, well, was but, going to um, like Easter Island part of you know biology evolution? Well, we didn't go there. That, yeah, no, we didn't go there. Oh, we were uh, the uh, they said, well, maybe the Galapagos. Well, we everybody really wanted to go to the Galapagos Islands, mm -hmm. and I will never forgive that one. Uh, one of the professors, he just got all twisted in a knot, and he, I mean, he was practically picketing the halls. Because said, oh no no, we'll disturb the environment. We can't have that. We can't put you know several hundred. It was just a few hundred, you know. But can't put several hundred people there, and uh, it'll it'll destroy everything and the ecosystem and the turtles. And he's going on and on. And they said, all right, all right, all right, no. So um, this was in the fifties we and sixties, uh, right? No, this was in the late sixties. Yeah, right. And uh, the well, uh, of course, within a year. Uh, the Chilean government uh, had um, instituted charter flights and started building tourist facilities there. So I, I am, you know, that's why that's why that guy remains in my memories of infamy because it was just so wrong. It was going anything he was complaining about was going to happen anyway, and we were the last group you could imagine that would have hurt anything. Well, yeah, uh, well controlled, looking for you know. Preservation of indigenous uh, environment, uh, scholastic. I mean, he must have been a fanatic. Maybe yeah. he maybe I mean, he, I, maybe I, he just read Rachel Carson. You know. 
uh, well, I went to a Quaker school. We all read Rachel Carson. I wasn't terribly convinced in the first place because I grew up on a farm. Mm-hmm. I mean, my father would sometimes – to decompress, his idea of decompressing after a long day working in a um, – um, well, basically a factory, a, a dry cleaning plant. He owned it, but he'd go there and, you know, it was, uh, the temperature was 104 in there all the time, you know, and chemicals everywhere. And he'd come home after a long commute, and then he'd get on a tractor and go out and knock stuff over, you know, and <laughs> dig things just to decompress. That made him feel better. And sometimes he'd do some spraying, and he'd come back in the house looking like Frosty the Snowman, completely completely dusted with like DDT. Oh, good God. Of course, he in 95. Well, that's an intriguing uh, paradox. Yeah, it didn't seem to hurt anything. But um, the, uh, in our, How much did he have um, to have breathed in? Cause well, who knows? Maybe, it, maybe it's just sturdy genes on my family. I, uh, in my family, I don't know, but it didn't, see, it didn't seem to bother him. That's amazing. So he lived in 95 yeah. with all... Uh, Oh, well, everything has an exception, I suppose. So um, how many countries total do you think you visited? About 130 or so. Oh, my God. You must have an absolutely treasure trove of stories. Yeah, once I got the the bug, I started, you know, just – oh, well, I'll give you a story from what the um, uh, lovely, lovely place formerly known as Yugoslavia – um, I was there when Tito was still in charge and uh, keeping a hard uh, hard line of control on the um, warring groups that wanted really just to beat each other up all the time. They're not quite as, uh, quite as um, death oriented as the folks in the Middle East, but you know they get they get cranky. And um, but he wanted to have factories, you know, like DeLoreans and stuff. And so he said, okay, if you if you start a fight like that on the assembly line, we'll kill you. That's, dictators can do that. Hmm. You know, so they all work together very nicely. And um, Wait a minute. We're, we're, we're losing your signal. Okay. That is back? But you're back. I didn't yeah. move. I didn't, yeah. I, I didn't move a millimeter. Uh, the... Um, yeah, I, we were probably both drunk at the time. I don't know. We were a bit drunk at the time, um, but uh, there isn't much else to do there, or there wasn't at the time. And I said, what's it like living here? You know, I mean, you got, you know, the best uh, standard of living in the Eastern Bloc and so forth, and it's a beautiful country, and people are nice and stuff. And he goes, it is very boring, hmm. he says. Did you ever get to the place no, he, that, that we're going to talk about tomorrow night with Sam Ismonigic, uh, now called Bosnia? Uh, well, let's see. That's part. Of, it used uh, to be part of Yugoslavia, yeah. 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 Well, then, yeah, yeah. I kind of, I kind of saw most of that. It's I, I so there's Serbia, there's Croatia, and there's Bosnia. And yeah, uh, I wasn't, uh, you know, I, I wasn't combing over every square inch of it, and uh, there weren't weren't a lot of ruins there. Um, at least we thought not. We were driving along the road looking for something else, and with you know we rented a car and we're tooling along outside of Dubrovnik. And um, so the um, guy in the passenger seat looks out and he goes, "Look, look up on that hill." And we look up on this ridge that's way up above us and said, "There's ruins up there. It's probably Roman because the Romans were there yeah. a long time ago." So we we park the Volkswagen, we get out, we hike up through all this scratchy brush and it took us about an hour and we get up there and there's this fort up at the top. Unfortunately, the whole thing was made out of styrofoam. What? Left over from some yeah, some Italian movie crew had just left it there when they finished oh. doing a, you know, one of those sandal and That's sword like movies. the story of Cecil B. DeMille who recreated ancient Egypt somewhere in a desert north of Los Angeles. And then at the end of the shoot, they just buried everything. Right. I think they found that about. They two did. Years ago, yes, they? they made a big deal yeah. several years ago. In fact, they even made a very crummy sci-fi movie about some monsters buried with the ancient curses of the Egyptian recreate. You know, you know, uh, Hollywood certainly sci-fi. Oh, is it Jordan or Morocco where you can now go to see Tatooine? Uh, uh, Morocco, the, the, Morocco. The, the, Yep. Yeah. 
yeah, that say they they say it fell into disrepair, but they got a lot of funding and it's all fixed up and they want to do. I don't know what you what the tourist aspect of that would be, but that's you can yeah, see ev- how you can see everything there with the double suns. Right. Okay, yeah, we've got about I, three minutes to the bottom of the hour. Um, when we come back, I want to talk to you about California and the fires. Because you and I were talking. I mean, this is a conversation that's going to skip all over the landscape, folks. So fasten your seatbelts. I have no idea where we're going next. But that's the fun of talking with a generalist because you never know when an experience is going to come up and say, hey, remember me? So we're going to talk about the fires because Ron and Ron has a very <laughs> interesting take about what's going on in California right now. And it feeds into one of our other guests. So when we come back, we're going to do all that. My my guest this morning is Ron Gerbron. Um, he is, as advertised, a generalist. I mean, what an incredible experience to have an education where you literally uh, get to see the world. I mean, what an extraordinary experience. Um, I used to think my growing up period was, was interesting. I mean, that doesn't that beat all? I mean, maybe we'll have to come back to that sometime during the show. Because it seems to me that that kind of experience of seeing the world, it's the, it's the ultimate adventure of getting on a uh, uh, freighter, you know, when you're a kid and just wandering off into the South Seas to see what there is to see. You're on the other side of midnight. My name is Richard C. Hoagland, and we shall return. Richard C. Hogland and his fascinating guests. Join Club 19.5 to get access to exclusive member benefits. Listen to past episodes anytime on any device. Search the archives of over 180 episodes. Membership cost $9.95 a month. 33 cents a day. Support the broadcast that provides you with the most interesting conversation available. Talk radio at the cutting edge of science and thought. The other side of midnight.com. Welcome back, everyone, to the other side of midnight. My guest this morning is Ron Gerberon, who, among other things, is a member of our Enterprise Mission Imaging team. And uh, we've been talking about uh, his background, seeing the world at 1819, not quite on a tramp steamer, but uh, very close, with extraordinary ports of call, introduced him to all kinds of uh, worldly experiences, including looking at... uh, looking at um, ruins 
And and I guess Ron, I should maybe before we get to the fires, I should ask you about that. Was this uh, yeah. growing up experience where you basically uh, got your taste for ancient paleo history and ruins and who the heck are we on this planet? Oh no, I got that on the uh, growing up long before that. I mean, the you got to remember that the that part of Pennsylvania is a very historical area. I mean, literally the kitchen was the original um, room of the house that got built on after that. Right. At the time of the Revolutionary War, it was the only thing that was there, and it, the local historical society verifies that uh, Washington and Lafayette sat at the table in the And I think we may have lost you again. You may have to move. On for a while. That took place right there. They always wanted to put a sign out by the highway. And my dad said, yeah, go ahead. And they said, okay, fine. Uh, need this few. We're having some, so some we're, you know, you're, you're breaking up. Maybe you need to move to oh. another part of the room or something. Cell uh, phones are, are not good for interviews. No, are we okay? Uh, Wait, that, can you hear me now? Yeah, that's much better, much better. Okay. I mean, uh, I mean, yeah, I move at the – the phone's moving around inside a little bubble, no bigger than a space helmet. So that's, <laughs> I guess, that's, that's the sweet spot. Uh, the um, no, anyway, the uh, yeah, that was he didn't want to give him forty acres of land, so he's uh, out front. So we don't have a sign, and there, but there's a place across the street that had nothing to do with anything that still got a sign that says 1704 Britain House on it. Um, but we used to turn up uh, not arrowheads. Only, but things like uh, cannonballs and you know miscellaneous bits that you would find on a battlefield from back then. Every t- every plot, and uh, it didn't come up during the show. But when you had Jim DeMaio on talking about the Reich stuff, right? You know, you didn't get to that. But the uh, there's a picture on the you know his web page shows the front of his book, and the there's a picture there of this orange box. Uh, right from what you can see. And I know what that was because it was one of those sitting in that very same field uh, that it had been there when my dad bought the place, I guess. And it was uh, no, wait, wait. You're whatever saying, they had done. You're, you're saying on your dad's farm in Pennsylvania, there was an orange orgone uh, tabulator, accumulator, whatever, or, huh, sitting on the farm. Yeah, you'll have yeah, you'll have to ask Dr. DeMaio what that uh, – DeMaio? Is it DeMaio or DeMaio? DeMaio. DeMaio, yeah. Have to, you'll have to ask him what those were for. I never knew. Except, I mean I knew you know, by name. I knew it was – oh, that's some sort of rice box thing. Well, I think but they nobody... were designed to affect the crops in terms of increasing yield and maybe that affecting would... weather uh, because if you, if you interact with the torsion field, you do both. That's what the you know decades and decades of research has now shown, and we're calling the this all this different stuff by different names, and it's all the same stuff. It's the ether, it's the torsion field, it's orgone energy, um, it's it's the same stuff. So apparently, whoever owned the farm before your dad, uh, either by his own lonesome, or because that he knew something that other folks didn't had one of these uh, gadgets in- installed to increase crop yield or change weather locally over the farm. Yeah, he was just sitting there. I think the far- I think the local the Pennsylvania Farm Bureau, which is you mm. kind of have to be a farmer to know what that is, but I think they were behind it. They were running some sort of um testing. They they used to do stuff like that uh apparently. And um uh, so it, this all I know is I, when I saw it, uh, I was like um, seven, and within two years it was gone. Somebody came and took it back for whatever it was. It wasn't doing anything while I while I did know it was there. I know that uh, it was just sitting there. But they they let yeah they took the box, but they left the post. So I wonder if there things. I wonder if there could be records if you could go back. If they if they're in paper form, they're in cartons in some warehouse, and if they're not, maybe someone's digitized them. But you could see how many of these boxes were scattered around the farm country, and what kind of systematic surveys or 
monitoring whatever were being done. Yeah. I assume it all just ended suddenly when he got uh, all that political trouble coming down on him. Uh, Reich, I mean. Yeah. And right. so they probably just, every probably everybody probably just pulled the plug on anything they were doing that in, involved any of that. Oh no, 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 we have nothing to do with that. No, no, mm. no, that's gone. You know, it, it's probably something like that. I don't know. Like I said, you had a guest on that probably knows something about that. If not, you could try the Pennsylvania Farm Bureau. That's. Um, I mean, we didn't even get to the Sasquatch, but uh, <laughs> okay, Pennsylvania let's, has those, you know. Let, uh, so I've heard, well, yes. Uh, but let's switch gears slightly. Yeah. The fires. You're in California. Yeah. You're in Southern California, right? Yes, sir. Are you safe? Because the whole damn oh, state's burning up again. I mean, it's not quite that bad, but it's it's the uh, the national coverage. I think is as much because of what the power company is doing. I think they're, this is kind of a thumb to the nose uh, response of theirs for being cited for billions of dollars of liability. Because I'm not sure that it was all entirely their fault. They're very, very good about coming out and dealing with stuff that you know, like a wire down or anything like that. Right. So, but if they were just, but if they were just weak and greedy and weren't upgrading stuff. Uh, it's not entirely their fault that we don't have the lines buried in the ground or in a, or in the undercarriage of a monorail pod or something uh, like we should have, you know. It's and that's all tied into that uh, concern about EMPs and so forth. Uh, you know, we should have that stuff buried and not in a place where it would get affected by a fire, but it's not. So they're liable that much. But beyond that, I don't know. Anyway, they seem to be. To being a little bitter, they even turned the power off here for half a day uh, a few days ago. Oh my! Like they were testing things out, you know. Just to, but what they were doing was they were tree trimming in the neighborhood. I could hear them rah, 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 grinding away at uh, tree branches that were intruding on the on the lines. They probably should do that more regularly. Well, but, the uh, the model yeah, is, the model that they've been proposing is that when you have high winds. Because for some reason there has not been maintenance. They, when when I, I remember when I was younger, yeah. I used to drive around and we would see these high tension lines looking like, you know, something out of uh, War of the Worlds. You know, these tall crane-like structures against the sky with the drooping high tension lines between them arcing over the landscape. And yes. if you were in an airplane, you could see where they were because they would clear. With the uh, cooperation of the uh, Forest Service, they would clear uh, a strip of land under the high tension lines. So if they had a break or if they had lines that touched and sparks, the sparks would not fall on foliage. It would fall on essentially small brush ground and it would quickly, you know, uh, cancel itself out. And I don't know whether they're still doing that. I saw some some uh, article the other day that said that they were no longer maintaining their right-of-ways. So when you have high winds and the lines swing back and forth and they touch something and they arc, which I find very bizarre in the design, that it's that arcing and those sparks that create these forest fires. And again, it seems like a very convoluted, uh, bizarre explanation for people that don't know anything because in all the years growing up around high tension lines, I never heard any of this. It, and we've had winds. No. We've had high tension lines. We've had right away issues. So what's changed? Is this merely a cover story for something much deeper and much more insidious? Uh, a lady I heard speaking on this, uh, on these kind of things. I, I have to put it that way because I remember. It was it was a woman, but I don't know uh, who it was. But I don't want to take credit for something. She was going on about how the this was connected to the chemtrails, uh, which have a lot of uh, very 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 fine aluminum powder in what has been tested out by people that have tried to capture samples and so forth. And um, if that falls down on the ground, uh, I mean that's. Uh, if you give it enough surface area, you know, by grinding it up really, really fine, uh, aluminum really is like a flash powder. And um, the uh, I think that's coating the trees in a lot of these places. It's mm. just sitting there. And when they when it gets a little dry and there's a little bit of a spark, they go thump, 
I mean, I was up at a bus st- at the bus stop about a half a mile away, and um, a couple weeks ago, and um, the um, this little fire started just like a block away, just along the highway. Right. I don't know whether uh, whether it was a cigarette butt or what. It doesn't uh, it didn't seem like that would be it uh, enough. But I, I mean, I see this little wisp of smoke, and um, you know, I like I said, I'm not very far away from it, but there's nothing I can do. I was re- getting ready to call somebody, and it goes, Foomph! and it just literally explodes. The right word, because oh. I mean, all of a sudden, every, everything on that hillside is a fire. Oh, just like like know, like, just like, like like the old-fashioned flash powder. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And there was no reason for that. I mean, it was not dense brush or anything like that. But you know, and it's where it starts working on a tree that's up the hill a bit. And uh, all of a sudden, fortunately, I see water spraying on it. And this is just, you know, a minute later. And I'm going, what's going on? So this was either a uh, one of those tests that the fire people do to um, test out their methods. You know, they've had about 40 percent of those go awry. You know, they get out of the get out of their um, control. And then they uh, sometimes they're major fires. You know, that happens everywhere. But it's a, it could have been something like that or a construction crew that just caused the tiniest spark because there's always building going on around here that I couldn't see. And, of course, they had a water tank with them. So as soon as they saw something spark, they started spraying water on it. But all I know is within a half an hour, the um, road was closed. Uh, there were more emergency vehicles and fire trucks showing up from even from far away all of a sudden than there were um, – 12 or so years ago when we had those big fires that everybody heard about and I got evacuated for those that did burn down here but um the uh, we you know we skated around it but it was um yeah I did get uh, did have to go to one of those shelters for a couple of days but the uh, yeah I, the way that fire uh advanced was just ridiculous I mean you know you've seen brush catch fire and it doesn't just go foom. Well, I almost, I almost, areas. I almost burned down our yard and barn when I was a kid, and my parents had a restaurant, <clears throat> and they told me to go outside and you know burn the trash, which was a normal thing in the country. No environmental laws, nobody coming for uh, you know to to look over your shoulder. So it was a very windy day. I remember I was ten or eleven, and I went down, took it down to the area in front of the uh, barn where we burned stuff. And I dumped it on the ground, and I lit it, and I went back to the house, and I looked out, and the wind had blown some of the papers up under the barn where the chickens were kept. And uh, yes, so I'm seeing the beginnings of a in conflagration engulfing the front of the barn where the chickens are. Of course, I'm a kid, 11, 12 years old, so I dash into the restaurant which is filled with customers in the afternoon my parents were running a restaurant and i scream there's a fire there's a fire out back and sitting at one table <clears throat> were a bunch of guys who said oh where would the i forget the name of the town volunteer fire department and they all stampeded out the back they kicked out the boards on the on the barn saved the chickens saved the barn <clears throat> but it took several minutes for it to even begin to burn a major wooden structure. So the idea that just in brush that you can have a flash like you saw in indicates something very different. Now, you know, we've had Dane Wigington on a couple, three times, and he's been telling us about the systematic spraying program, the chemtrails, uh, which I think he has another formal scientific name for it, geoengineering environmental modification, something like that. Anyway, there is a recorded record amount of aluminum, as you just said, uh, in this material that's falling out of the stratosphere as part of this coordinated program. And I saw a number the other day that pre-chemtrails, the amount of aluminum, powdered aluminum in the soil was like seven hundredths of a pound or something like that per acre. And someone did an essay recently and published these notes. They did uh, another set of acreage, and it turns out now to be something like 1,500 pounds per square acre, which is like insane. Where is it coming from? Obviously from the sky. 
Yeah, unless the uh, you know, unless the local rodent population is taken to chewing on what is it bauxite? <laughs> raw, uh, uh, old abandoned, old abandoned Pepsi cans. Yeah, yeah, I don't think that's I don't think that's probably it. Yeah, right. yeah, that's why I was intrigued by that. So that's I, I don't like spouting un uh, credential credentialable uh, facts, but that's. Uh, that you know, and especially since I saw that fire go swoomph uh, a couple weeks ago. You know, they got it out, like I said, but then the highway ended up closed for three hours because I, I think maybe they were freaked out and they were making sure, or they were just uh, muscling us around. I am, yeah, what the, do we matter? The, the thing that I'm people. so intrigued with, and this is where we're going to go off the rails for a lot of people, but I warn you tonight: when you get two generals together <clears throat> in a bar. And they start talking. Yes. It can go in very strange directions. I have a completely separate idea for why the chemtrail spraying and the aluminum present in the residues. Um, Ooh. Okay. This goes I'll back to our this. work. This goes back to our work with the physics. Remember the one active element that we now have identified <clears throat> in terms of isomers, which are isotopes that have spins in the nucleus in a certain way and the torsion field model is rotation, rotation, rotation. The one element that seems to block torsion, uh, a torsion field, torsion measurements, whatever, is aluminum. And it's because of the isomer spins. I began taking note of all this aluminum falling out of the stratosphere, being dumped into the skies through this systematic spraying. I mean, they used to do this here in New Mexico every single day. You'd look up and you'd see these these lines or geometric patterns. And one time many years ago, there was a big X right over our, our, our house in chemtrail spray. Now, you cannot imagine that's a normal airliner going from Dallas to Los Angeles, uh, you know, stopping to make a big X in the sky. I don't think so. This was back when I was on Art Bell a lot, and I was talking about this stuff. Uh-huh. Think of this. If aluminum blocks torsion, and the torsion field is basically the conveyor of consciousness for uh, intelligent creatures on planet Earth, and someone is trying to block our connection to the field to keep us dumbed down, could this be the reason for the massive chemtrail spraying with, among other things, active agent aluminum in the residue? Uh, could be. And how would, Probably we test, is. how would we test for that? Because it's global. And again, the model says that the physics is rising to a point where people should be really, really, really sharper and catching on to things much quicker. And of course, in some areas, they are. But if there was a systematic effort to keep people dumbed down so they don't notice what's going on politically, culturally, geopolitically, globally, environmentally, etc., what better way than to cut off their access to the field? I mean, you know the studies that basically trace now the origins of Alzheimer's to an excess of aluminum in the brain, right? Yeah, I've heard that, yes. And I think it's the same thing. I think Alzheimer's is basically when you're cut off from the field or source or whatever you want to call it, people lose their minds. And I think every Alzheimer's case where they have trouble taken the trouble to trace the aluminum content, they find a correlation. Uh-huh. Now, correlation is not causation, but if this is really... You know, if, if, if we're really walking VR examples, the consciousness is not in your brain, but your brain is basically a transceiver. So it connects to the you that really is, you know, somewhere up the line, other dimension, higher dimension in the field, whatever. If you cut sure. off that connection, what are you going to wind up with if taken to the ultimate extreme? Alzheimer's disease. At least that's my very speculative idea. Well, here, I, here's the same thing said from a slightly different perspective, I think, because this, this is the way I look at it. Uh, there's, it's, 
it's been clear to me for a long time that there's some sort of um, assembly of minds. You know, they, people talk about their higher self and so forth, but that's something that's like unique to humans. Uh, a lot of animals don't each have a soul and a higher mind, but they share a group mind. You know, this is why birds that are migrating make those precision oh, turns those when they're in the flocking time for them maneuvers and uh, yeah. uh dolphins and and swordfish and uh piranhas i mean the flocking or or group instincts ants. and ants, ants yes yeah the the um yeah they're they're those kind of maneuvers are governed by their um group mind and so what that means is that there's a template See, we, uh, a lot of people talk about the uh, human uh, configuration ha- being basically a template. Well, I think just like anything, we've got uh, extraordinary self-repair capabilities for it, but it's based upon that. It's like the um, uh, it's like the boot record on an old computer. You know, like you had a fallback. You know, it said, "Oh, you really screwed everything up, and you got this malware that just deleted half your apps." And so we're going to, uh, you know, you're going to have to go back to the and let the machine put the original pieces back. Well, I think you have something like that in the genome, uh, but it's a template. It's like part of the body's muscle memory and that, and uh, the more uh, the chemical parts of that. And uh, so. That would connect also with that oversoul group mind. There's a million names for it. And that's very hyperdimensional or resonant, if, mm. if you will. But the more you – and the more you can identify with it, the more you can tie those together, the uh, more effectively you can repair things uh, in, your, you know, in yourself because uh, you're normally fighting against yourself all the time. Like when you eat most of what you like to eat, and I'm not going to stop eating <laughs> what I like to eat. It's just, that's by God, that's what this, that's what it's for. We're supposed to deal with this stuff, you know. Uh, the um, and for the vast audience out there, no, I'm not fat. <laughs> Far no, from Ron me. is definitely I, not. I fat. wear the same size. I wear the same pants. I wear, say, yeah, some of them are the same. But I you do a lot them. of walking. Uh, the same pants I did in high school. Yeah, I do. Less than I used to, but I was, I was, yeah, when I was younger, I was one of those compulsive exercise people. You know, I mean, it's, it's ridiculous, but you try and be subtle about it. You know, it's like in a Jason Bourne movie, you know, every time he sees a tree limb, he jumps up and does a couple of chin ups on it, mm. that kind of thing. Uh, when I was working but, in New York, you know, I mean, cabs are, I, I hated subways, you know, stuck in a hole in the ground, regardless of what that uh-huh. movie said. Uh, and cabs, of course, are phenomenally expensive. So unless I was on, an expense account with the networks or whatever, I would walk the length and breadth of Manhattan. And it's really doable. Mm. You know, it's a wonderful place to walk. Um, I used to try to stay out of Central Park after midnight, but uh, I would walk an awful lot in New York, and I I, uh, I maintain a very um, youthful figure, as they used to say. Yes, you do. You're quite fit. We're, um as far as I as well, far as I I, I, I I do less walking in the desert, particularly during the summer, because it gets so infernally hot. So my walking is kind of confined to sunrises and sunsets, mostly sunsets. But uh, as the weather gets cooler, you know, I can do more walking. And we have lots of hills here. So, so okay, if if this model yeah. is not crazy, you're saying that yeah. consciousness basically starts out as a group template, and then as we're more conscious, there's more individualization. Is that a word? Um, individuation, I think. Ah, okay, thank you. Yeah, but something like that. Uh, yeah, yeah, pretty, pretty much. I, um, you know, you can. So people can look at that as you know individual uniqueness as much as they like. I mean, I we uh, most of the stories that people have, the most of the narratives that are out there about. Uh, what humanity is uh, have certain common elements that work. You know, like when you talk about this as the, um, well, the meat body or the uh, or a carrier or a vessel or anything like that. Uh, these are not concepts that were alien to you know people in ancient times and various cultures either. It's just there's something almost common sense about it. You know, and like if you've ever, sadly, seen someone die, you know, you can see something leave 
I've you heard know, it's that. Not just that the, I, I've not, heard that they get very, very still. Yeah. You, uh huh. It's, uh, it, yeah. I mean, if you're a uh, if you're a um, professional killer, then you kind of enjoy watching that, I guess. But uh, mm. other than that, it's it's a bit disturbing. Uh, and, oh, there was a character on Game of Thrones that used to say that. He said there was a but uh, Clegane. He said there's nothing like it. Nothing like it. Well, yeah. uh, okay, that's fine for him. But um, yeah, it's uh, so the you can make it metaphysical, you can make it medical, uh, you can make it religious, and it all is talking about pretty much the same thing. Well, the thing that is, occurs to me know, is these coincidences because you've got the physics peaking, We're coming up to a node, the famous Mayan calendar, once every twenty six thousand years. Twenty twelve really wasn't twenty twelve; it was twenty sixteen. And now we're living in the aftermath. Uh, that's according to exactly. the, uh, the the numbers. Okay. If consciousness should peak, if receptivity, if our higher selves can communicate better now than at any other time, maybe in the last 6,000 years or 12,000 or 26,000, and there's a hidden agenda to keep people, you know, as, as Alex Jones says, you know, on a, on a um, uh, you know, prison planet, what better way – than to use as an excuse the chemtrailing of the skies so that you could basically just keep them down on the farm by keep them, keeping them fat, dumb, and uh, happy. Right. Well, they're neither – they're fat. They're dumb. I don't know how happy people are at the moment. But That's um, right. That's right. Okay. So hold yeah. it there. We're at the top of the hour. My guest this morning is Ron Gerbron, and as you can see, our conversation is going in – very unpredicted changes. So um, just hang in there. You're on the other side of midnight. My name is Richard C. Hoagland. We shall return. Thanks for listening to this exciting first hour. Now, the second and third hour of the show is available to Club 19.5 members only. Please support the show by subscribing to Club 19.5 and join our very interesting community. To do that, please visit the website, theothersideofmidnight.com, and click on the Join Club 19.5 link in the left-hand column. As a Club 19.5 member, you'll gain access to the rest of this show and all previous 350-plus shows that we have done. Now, recent Club 19.5 member archive recording have the commercials removed, and the sound quality has been enhanced. You'll also receive a dedicated private podcast feed that contains these enhanced show recordings. And you'll be able to download the MP3 files directly from the archive if you prefer. As a Club 19.5 member, you'll also be the first to preview our new videos and reports. We'll be adding exclusive new features to Club 19.5 as we go forward. And boy, have we got some amazing things to tell you about in the coming weeks. So please support the show and don't miss all the exciting new things we have planned. I want to thank all our Club 19.5 members because without your guys' support, this show would not be on the air. Please help us continue growing the show by subscribing to Club 19.5 today. And when I say we really need you, we really need you. Over and out. Mm-hmm.